The 6 o'clock news starts right now. The Census Bureau launching an aggressive full-on effort to get the census taken by the end of the year. That will include a boots-on-the-ground project here beginning next week. Paul Venema with a look at who the census workers are trying to reach and what challenges the pandemic poses in this door-to-door -door campaign. Yes, I wanted to see if I could complete my questionnaire on the phone. With a late September deadline fast approaching to get the count completed, the Census Bureau is launching a major push. We need everybody to participate and act now to respond to the census. Vicki McIntyre is the deputy director of the Dallas Regional Census Center. She says that so far, 93 million households have responded. Pandemic protocol will be part of the door-to-door -door push, which is targeting those who have still not responded. We've changed our training to include um, information on safety procedures, um, how that they need to back up um, after they knock on a door, step away from the door to make sure we're allowing for social distancing. All staff members will have badges and other things, such as briefcases, identifying them as legitimate census workers. The field data collecting will end on September 30th and data processing will get underway. Now is the time to respond. It's not too late. Um, you can go online, you can call, and if you happen to still have your paper form, you can fill it out and, and mail it in. The deadline for the census to be completed is December 31st. Paul Venema, KSAT 12 News. New at 6 details on how the city could use a sales tax to train workers for in-demand jobs. Under the plan presented to the council today, voters would be asked to approve redirecting the one-eighth of a cent that currently funds an aquifer protection program in Lanier Creek Parkways after it expires next year. Garrett Berger talked with Mayor Ron Nuremberg, who is pushing for this initiative not only as a way to recover from the pandemic, but to grow past where the city was. As the COVID-19 pandemic continues, more than 150,000 area workers find themselves displaced, according to the city. Mayor Ron Nuremberg thinks there's a way to help about 40,000 residents find a path to a better career with a workforce development program. It's huge. Uh, this will be one of the largest, um, most impactful economic initiatives ever undertaken by the city of San Antonio as a community. The initiative would be a continuation of a short-term pandemic recovery plan the city council has already approved to help another 10,000 people. But unlike that one, which only lasts through next September and is focused entirely on workforce training, the sales tax supported initiative would also cover two and four year degrees in targeted industries. It will also include uh, wraparound case management services to help remove obstacles that may appear. The mayor believes the program could have long term effects on the city. We want to make sure that we can take this place and underemployed San Antonians, get them the skills to be able to fill those jobs that are here and those that we know are coming. In accordance with the deal announced last month between the mayor and via Metropolitan Transit officials, the city would stop getting the tax money after four years. After that, VIA officials want the tax dollars to permanently go to the Advanced Transportation District. They're working on their own ballot initiative to make that happen. But to get the issues in front of voters this November, both sides need to act by August 17th. Council members will discuss the city's portion again next week. Gary Berger, KSAT 12 News. Just because a lot of students will be going back to school digitally doesn't mean they can skip their vaccinations this year. The Texas Department of State Health Services says school vaccination rules are in effect for the 2020-2021 school year, regardless of whether the education is received virtually or in person. That goes for college students as well. Metro Health leaders saying skipping vaccinations can lead to epidemics of diseases like measles on top of the current pandemic. They have to register to be in that school and to be part of the educate, education curriculum. They will be asking for an immunization record, so they will know. The Metro Health Clinic will be, op be open beginning August 17th, but to take precautions, they will not be accepting walk-ins. You must make an appointment, and everyone over the age of two must wear a mask inside. For those without insurance or a primary care doctor, head to KSAT.com for a list of clinics providing free vaccinations. A new study that UT Health San Antonio researchers are participating in is providing some frightening new details of an inflammatory condition associated with children who get COVID-19. The National Institutes of Health headed up that study looking into what happens to a small percentage of children who
who survived COVID, only to end up in the emergency room weeks later with another serious condition. Ursula Perry has new details about what's now being called multi-symptom inflammatory syndrome of children, or MISC. The study UT Health San Antonio doctors participated in was just published in the New England Journal of Medicine. It's breaking new ground, drilling down into why an extremely small percentage of children end up in the emergency room three to four weeks after they had COVID-19. And some of the reviews that, and reports that we read, the patients underwent an abdominal surgery because they thought it was appendicitis, when in fact it was this hyperinflammatory syndrome. The symptoms include a sudden fever, severe abdominal pain, redness in the eyes, and diarrhea. What we're starting to see now, where three to four weeks after a child has had coronavirus, they will present to the ER in hyperinflammatory shock. It was once thought to be Kawasaki disease, but now Dr. Moriera and others say it's its own virus associated with coronavirus. It may be an autoimmune response to the disease, and it shows signs of causing long-term damage to the heart and the brain of a child, 19% of whom had no symptoms of COVID whatsoever. And there's one more thing that the UT Health San Antonio researchers have noticed. They are concerned that they found children who have coronavirus can at the very same time also have a case of influenza. This is serious business because both viruses can cause severe respiratory distress, require ICU care, and both can be deadly. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. We now know the name of a man killed in a weekend crash on the city's south side. The Bear County Medical Examiner's Office says 35 year old Juan Ramon Ramirez Mencia was killed Saturday night along Loop 1604. At the time, Bear County deputies say the two vehicles collided head on. Ramirez Mencia died at the scene. Two other people were taken to the hospital. An investigation into what led up to it is still ongoing. Let's take a look at tra time saver traffic right now. Here is the trans guide camera I 10 West at 410 South. You can see there there was a fire truck there on the side of the road. We've got a rollover accident being reported. Definitely slowing things down here. This is the westbound off ramp at Callahan. Uh, you can see for sure there's a slowdown. We've got crews there out on uh, the roads trying to get this cleared up and you can see that car upended there in between what looks like the tow truck and the fire truck that are responding there on scene. New at six, you've surely heard about it. Millions of federal dollars sent to small businesses struggling with the impact of COVID-19. But thanks to a private donor, a professional photographer was the first to get a helping hand from the nonprofit Maestro. But Jesse Degollado finds even smaller amounts can mean the world to some local entrepreneurs. What? <laughs> oh my God, that's amazing. Thank you. The oh professional photographer who captured these images had just learned she was the first to receive $500 from the Maestro Entrepreneur Center. I almost never win anything, so I was really surprised. Yian Segovia says the center's resources for small business owners like her already have been invaluable. $500 may not sound like a lot. No, that's a lot of money. <laughs> Segovia says she'll use it to improve her skills, maybe take a couple of courses, buy some equipment. By registering her business on the Buy Local Grow San Antonio website, the Maestro Center says Segovia increased her chances of winning. Segovia was the first randomly selected every week through September 23rd. Even if you don't win the $500, I really recommend you registering because you can win so much more than that. Access to the kind of resources she says are critical to a small business surviving the pandemic. We're providing as much information and as much resources as we can so these businesses can pivot and don't have to close their doors. Jesse Degollado, KSAT 12 News. All right, let's take a live look with live cam. 98 degrees out there. Not a cloud. Yeah. At five, he called it a bluebird day. So we okay. focus on the blue skies, not so much the temperatures. And the birds, the beautiful birds. Okay, a little distraction. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you, you know, I had a really nice nest of cardinals before the hailstorm. Ah. Then we got the hailstorm and they're gone. Aww. It's unfortunate, yeah. You can see the little babies popping their heads up. So hopefully those they're okay, but 
I haven't seen them return. I hope they just found a new home. Anyway, aquifer, no change today. At least it's holding steady, and we're actually two tenths of a foot above the August average. Here's your pollen count. Mold high at 4,500 and pigweed on the low end at 20. Temperature wise, well into the 90s, just flirting with 100. 99 in New Braunfels. We're 98 in Castorville, 94 Tarpley and Port SA right now at 98 degrees. Uneventful this evening. Fairly typical August evening, clear sky, bit of humidity in the air and a light southeasterly breeze. Great conditions to view the space station flyover. 916 PM, look off to the north northwest. This one's only going to last four minutes. Then tomorrow, other than some morning clouds, a lot of afternoon sunshine and high temperatures right up near 100 yet again. And by the way, it is a CPS Energy Power Saver Day. We'll be stressing our energy grid tomorrow. So CPS Energy always suggests that you lower your usage between 3 and 7 p.m. We'll be back to talk about uh, the seven day forecast and how hot it's going to get coming right up. It is just about time for the daily briefing where our city and county leaders give us a rundown of the latest numbers of COVID-19 here in San Antonio and Bear County. We're hopeful that we will see that positive trend of the hospitalizations going down, hospital capacity going up. Let's go to City Hall. All right, apparently they're having audio problems right now from City Hall. Um, we'll stick with this just for a second, but if they don't get it figured out, we're just going to move on and talk to our friend Adam Kasky about, you know, the triple digit numbers he's been working on this week. And it seems we, as if they're having a 41,614 in our community since this began. Our seven day rolling average now is 397, which is again going in the right direction. But again, uh, please stay vigilant. COVID-19 is still in our community, and if we keep up the mask wearing and physical distancing, we will avoid another spike in cases. It's critically important, especially as we get towards schools and Labor Day, that we get transmission down as low as we possibly can. That allows the testing and tracing and isolation to really be effective and for us to get a handle on this pandemic. So the bottom line is don't fumble at the end zone. Our area hospitals have admitted now 68 new positive pa patients since yesterday. The average number of COVID hospital admissions over the previous seven days is 71. So we're dropping a little bit in hospital admissions and that is a good thing. We have 14 new deaths to report tonight, which brings a total to 394. Uh, that also is part of the, the log that we're coming down from the cases investigated, investigated from the state data. Uh, that includes seven Hispanic males in their 30s, 40s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, two white males in their 70s and 80s, one black male in his 50s, and four Hispanic females in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. And please remember, again, want to emphasize that each of these people that we have lost is a neighbor, a loved one, a friend, a family member, uh, a colleague, and keep them and, your, and their families in your prayers. Over in our hospitals tonight, we're reporting 817 people in the hospital, down 21 from yesterday. 345 are in the ICU, that's up nine from yesterday. And 238 are on ventilators, up four from yesterday. 49% of our ventilators are available, as well as 13% of our staffed hospital beds, and our hospital system remains under severe stress. Let me turn it over now to Judge Nelson Wolf. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. And the 340 uh, that we're reporting today, COVID cases, that sort of backed up from yesterday and some light reporting from Sunday. So that number certainly does look better. Um, and we are doing better in our hospital systems. Uh, we did verify that 24% of the COVID cases that are in the hospital come from outside of Bear County. The strike region, I think, region is about 22 counties. But we're also bringing in people from Laredo, as far away as Laredo. I think they brought in 11 of them from Laredo today. So uh, uh, that number is a pretty accurate number to be able to say. And our hospital, total hospitals, were taken up with 35% with um, COVID patients. Now we're down to 21%. So those numbers do look better. But as the mayor says, uh, we still got a long, long way to go to get back where we were. Uh, before things came unhinged and the face mask was done away with. While we're doing good there, we're, we're doing uh, worse in the jail. 
Uh, we had brought down our COVID cases in the jail to 20, uh, maybe 30 days or so ago. Uh, but each day is creeping up, and now we're 129 in the jail have COVID. And uh, it's getting very, very frustrating uh, as that number goes up because of what the state's done to us. Uh, 390 paper, paper made prisoners are ready to go to prison, but they're not taking them. We have 96 people that have been um, adjudicated and said they should go to state treatment beds. They're still sitting in the jail because they're not making it, uh, they're not making the beds available. And we have 649 in the jail that would have been PR bond, personal recognizance bond, which carries responsibility with it, I might add. Uh, they're there because of the, what the governor did in changing the directions and overruling uh, some, of, some of the judges. He did that order back on March the 29th. So we have 3,700 up in, in the jail, up 800 from where we were. We're having to put people in isolation units. You get tested, you have COVID, you go in that isolation unit. You come in, you stay 14 days in a different isolation unit till we make sure you don't have it. So what we're seeing is a really, really uh, growing problem in the jail. We have 62 people, in, in, uh, 62 guards and, and civilians out because of COVID. And it's costing the taxpayers um, $50,000 a day uh, because of these uh, actions by the state. So if you have any influence, and I, by the way, I did bring that up to the, to the governor yesterday, and he made note of it, but I uh, wasn't giving any reassurance about anything. So if you got any influence with the governor of the state of Texas, uh, you might want to say, hey, we're tired of paying $50,000 a day. Thank you very much, Judge. And, and I also want to remind folks that even if your family is not one of those that has suffered the devastating impacts of COVID-19, staying home and physical distancing does, uh, we know, have an impact on our mental health. So if you need help, uh, please know that you're not alone. Some frustration being shown there by County Judge Nelson Wolf, particularly with the state of Texas and the fact that there is what he calls a growing problem at the Bear County Jail. Uh, just a week ago, they had 20 cases. They're now up to 129 cases with inmates, and he blames the state for the majority of that for not taking some of the people that are available to be transferred to state run facilities. The state is not taking those transfers right now. They haven't for quite some time, and that is causing what he believes is a problem in the jail. And he's saying it's causing costing taxpayers $50,000 a day because of the state not taking some of these transfers. In the meantime, in today's daily briefing, we are continuing to see good news trickle in uh, some positive trends. The seven day rolling average is now down to 397 cases uh, here in San Antonio. The hospitalizations, that number does continue to trend downward. We also did hear uh, Judge Wolf say that 24% of COVID patients currently in Bear County hospitals are actually patients from outside of Bear County. That's again one of those discrepancies that they have been working on trying to refine. So I thought that was worth noting uh, in today's stats as well. All right, let's switch to weather right now. Let's talk about it. Like I said, some of the triple digit numbers that Adam Kasky has been dealing with over there, Adam. Yeah, and at the airport officially in San Antonio, 99 for the high temperature today. So just shy of the triple digit mark, the record being 104 set back in 2013 and the average high 96. Now we had nothing but sunshine throughout the midday and afternoon hours. There was some activity northeast of town. I mean, far to the northeast, talking Dallas, Texarkana, now down into Louisiana. Nice little disturbance in the upper level flow. Too far away from us, too far removed to give us any energy and boost to our atmosphere. Big Blue H upper level high, that's settling in instead. And well, we all know what that does to our rain chances. Unfortunately, looking pretty bleak here for the foreseeable future. I have a 10% chance in on Saturday. That's about it, and mainly along the coastal bend. Otherwise, temperatures right now, Abilene Midland at 100, Del Rio 103, 98 here in San Antonio right now, along with Catula, and in the hill country, we're generally in the mid 90s. A bit of humidity in the air, it's noticeable, it's not oppressive, and it's not enough to really boost the heat index and really kick up that the heat indices, anything more than a degree or two from the actual air temperature. So tomorrow morning, 77 to start the day, 
some morning clouds, then a lot of sunshine by the midday and afternoon. Sunny and hot right near 100 again for the high temperature. We get on into Friday and the weekend. No big changes right near 100, give or take a degree. There's that 10% chance on Saturday. Maybe a rogue pop up, but we think most of the activity is going to be along the coastal bend uh, Saturday and Sunday. Otherwise, we get into next week, and I think we'll really top out and max at 102 on Monday. So no big changes temperature-wise, and right now, no big systems to bring us any good chance of rain. I'll have an update on our space station flyover for tonight and how you can see it coming up later. All right. Thank you, Adam. All right. The Spurs are competing in the bubble. There's no doubt about that, but these losses, wow. Hard ones. Today. Yeah, well, and especially today when Memphis loses. So yeah. the Spurs have another opportunity to pick up some ground on eighth place Memphis Grizzlies. I'll tell you what, Expree said, man, the Spurs are playing, but they come up short again today. Plus, Jeff Trailer, UTSA head football coach, talks about the toughest challenge heading into fall camp. Coming up. and Nuggets faced off in Orlando today. Denver third in the West came out on fire. Michael Porter Jr. goes three ball. It's 9-4 Denver. They led 14-4 with 7.47 left in the frame. And that's when Pop benched all five of his starters. We've seen him do that before. Second unit response, Patty Mills from downtown. Caps a 10-0 run. The Spurs trailed 18-16. Rudy Gay now ties it at 26 all with a deep three from the weak side. Denver led 32-28 after one. Second quarter, Derek White drives, stops and so makes a tough layup under the rim and one free throw good and it's 47 41 Denver big sequence here with 36 seconds remaining tied at 62 Nikola Jokic turns into Drew Eubanks for the bucket and foul but pop challenges and calls for an offensive foul he was right take the hoop away moments later Keldon Johnson sinks a three and it's 65 62 Spurs your halftime score now Spurs open the third quarter on a 6-0 run. Joker with a bad pass. DeMar pokes it away. DeJounte Murray tracks it down and lays it in. 71-62 Spurs. Timeout Denver. Tied at 87 now. Keldon Johnson feeds Eubanks. 14-foot hook shot. Spurs go up two. And we're tied at 89 after three. Fourth quarter, Jakob Pertl ties it at 97. But Denver would pull away after that to beat the Spurs. 132-126. to most teams score over 100 points. There's a lot of mistakes made, right? So there's always things to clean up. A team that wins a championship will look at a film and have a lot of things to clean up. Everybody's going to turn it over, miss shots, get back backdoored, not block out. It's all the same stuff. Spurs will face the Utah Jazz Friday at noon local time. Now Memphis played Utah this afternoon without Jaron Jackson Jr. who's done for the season with a meniscus tear. Third quarter Grizzlies job ja Morant ties it at 70 all with a triple try. He had 20 points. Fourth quarter the Jazz pull away tied at 102. Mike Connolly Jr. for three in the lead for good. Utah comes from 13 down to win 124 to 115. So Memphis Fifth straight loss overall and fourth in the bubble. So the Grizzlies hold on eighth place is down to one game on ninth place. Portland, the Spurs are two back and certainly missed a great opportunity to pick up some ground. UTSA football scheduled to kick off fall camp on Friday morning under first year head coach Jeff Trailer. It's been a long time coming after COVID-19 wiped out spring ball. On top of that, the virus is messing up their schedule. Their 2020 season opener September 5th at LSU was canceled after the SEC went to conference only games, and they also lost their week two game, their home opener with Grambling State when the Southwestern Athletic Conference chose to move, chose to move football to the spring. Today, during a Zoom media session, Coach Trader discussed some of the challenges he's dealing with. The, the hardest part, is we don't know exactly when we're going to play. Um, you know, what if a game jumps up August 29th? Uh, what if we don't play to September 12th? So that, that's, that's been the hardest part, to be very honest with you. The second hardest part is, you know, like for breakfast, uh, only half of them can be in there at a time. So you've got to double schedule breakfast. you got to double schedule lunch. you got to double schedule supper. you got to double schedule meeting time because we can't all be in the building at the same time. UTSA Athletic Director Lisa Campo said in a statement the program remains committed to a 12-game schedule. As of now, the Roadrunners' first game is Saturday, September 12th at Texas State. 
I thought for sure when he said breakfast, he was going to say, like, what to have for breakfast, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah, we've got things like breakfast. Breakfast, lunch, yeah. dinner, you know. Cereal, waffles. <laughs> it's a tough decision. Thanks, Larry. <laughs> you got we'll it. We'll be right back. If you're part of an organization that's focused on improving your area, you could get some financial backing to help that cause. Through a crime prevention grant program, the San Antonio Police Department is giving out money seized through asset forfeiture so that those with good intentions can reinvest in the community. Devin Clark spoke to a senior vice president of one nonprofit organization who put in a bid and shows us how she plans to use the funds if they're granted. It's an effort the San Antonio Police Department says gives people the power to make necessary safety improvements in their community. I allocated $150,000 to create the Community Crime Prevention Grant that will allow neighborhood and community organizations to apply for funding to develop and implement innovative crime prevention strategies in your neighborhood. An initiative well received by Beverly Watts Davis, the Senior Vice President for West Care Texas. This announcement came to the community as 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 a wonderful uh, surprise. Davis is hoping to get the money and use it to expand the nonprofit's longtime mission to uplift and nurture those in underserved or struggling areas. She says a main focus will be funding efforts to bridge the gap between police and the communities they serve. We have historical evidence, years and years of evidence that show when the community is working hand in hand with with um, the police and the, they are working together, it is the most effective reduction and prevention of crime strategy that there is. SAPD reports that violent crimes throughout the city rose between April and June, with June topping out at more than 1,200 combined reports of rape, robbery, aggravated assault, and homicide. Davis is hoping to help change the negative statistics. If awarded, she says she'll use the money to expand past successes they've seen in neighborhoods, particularly on the east side. I do not want to put a Band-Aid, a little bitty Band-Aid on a 12-foot wound. What we are really looking to do it's actually solve a problem. The deadline to apply for the grant is August 11th, and we have information on how to do so right now on KSAT.com. Reporting in the newsroom, Devin Clark, KSAT 12 News. One of the companies fast-tracking a coronavirus vaccine says it's on track to finish enrollment for a phase three study before October. Moderna also says it plans to make the vaccine affordable, less than $40 per dose for most customers. Moderna is just one of several U.S. drug companies racing to come up with a successful vaccine. Novavax and Pfizer have also had promising vaccine results so far. Some of those clinical trials for a vaccine are happening right here in San Antonio. And that's the focus of this week's new episode of KSAT Explains. KSAT Explains this week is all about where we are in the effort to find that vaccine. What does it take and why San Antonio? What makes us a good place for this critically important work to happen? The new episode of KSAT Explains out tomorrow on the KSAT TV app and KSAT.com. Search for a vaccine. Give it a shot. All right, it is uh, See, 99 it degrees. Give it a shot. I got that one. I don't even think you knew you did it. No, I, no I he just, did. Okay. He did. I just moved quickly because it wasn't one of my best. <laughs> <laughs> 99 degrees out there for our official high, correct? Yes, and good viewing for the space station flyover tonight. Yesterday it was a really quick one. It only lasted one minute. Tonight, you've got four minutes of visibility of the space station. Starts at 9.16 p.m. Here, I'll help, I'll help you out. Hey, Alexa, set reminder for 9.16 p.m. Space station flyover. There you go. Some of you, I just helped you out there. Otherwise, hey, Siri, set alarm for 9.16. You are making some people probably angry right now. Yeah. I'm trying to help them out. I know, I know what your intention is, I'm just saying. Mine went off over there. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So it's going to be cool. You'll be able to see a nice clear sky for it. Good visibility. Look off to the north northwest at 916. You only get four minutes. So this is going to be a quick one. If it's not too late for the kids, head outside and you will see it nicely. That nice bright spot quickly moving through the sky. Look at that. Not a cloud overhead right now. You head off into parts of northeast Texas there, Texarkana. Metroplex as well. Yeah, we have some clouds and they're lucky enough and fortunate to get some showers today. You see those thunderstorms blossoming, especially down in southern Louisiana now. But for us, 
Upper level high, little too close. It's deflecting that energy and activity too far out of our area. We were fortunate on Monday, but now that activity is out of here and the energy is too far to the east because the big blue H is taking over our weather pattern again. And it's going to be that way for several days here. As for the tropics, there's one little cluster of unorganized thunderstorms. It's going to have a really tough time developing into anything. National Hurricane Center is giving it a 10% chance. That's this little cluster just west of Bermuda. It has some stronger upper level winds that are moving overhead and that tends to cut these systems apart before they can really develop and a little bit of dry air, not to mention just a touch of Saharan dust there. And typically research indicates that the Saharan air layer, the dust in the air from Africa will inhibit the development or real strengthening of those tropical systems. So that plays a role as well. Speaking of the dust, you look over the Caribbean now, Puerto Rico area as well, and there's this little batch of dust that's going to be moving westward. I think we'll be OK until we get to Sunday. Brief period of time. One day is when we're expecting this dust to push overhead. And it's going to be a fairly thin plume, not a very dense area of dust, but just enough to be a little noticeable as we get into Sunday. No dust out there right now. 98 degrees, dew point is 62, so a bit of humidity, but it only adds one degree to the heat index value. We're 93 in Beeville, 94 in Kerrville, for the most part 90s. Del Rio an exception at 103 in Dryden right now at an even triple digits. So when we wake up in the morning, or I should say at sunrise tomorrow morning, about 7 a.m., 70s, mid to upper 70s for a good portion of South Texas, into the lower 70s in the hill country. So Rock Springs 73 tomorrow morning. Then by the afternoon, we do it all over again, get right up near 100, give or take a degree or two. Hondo about 102, Catula 101 tomorrow, and New Braunfels at 101. Right near 100 uh, here locally around Bear County. Timberwood Park, we're thinking 98, Bernie 97 tomorrow afternoon. Meanwhile, 100, La Soya, and even Elmendorf triple digits along with Lavernia. Other than some morning clouds, bright sunshine again tomorrow. Clear sky, sunny, and of course, noticing the heat. This is, climatologically speaking, the hottest time of the year here in San Antonio. And tomorrow, it has been uh, calculated that tomorrow is going to be an extra stress on our power grid. So CPS Energy always recommends on these power saver days to lower your electri electricity use between 3 and 7 p.m. That's during peak demand. All right, looking ahead, 10% chance of a pop-up shower too on Saturday. Otherwise, no big changes, just more of the same. And we repeat this weather pattern. All right, thanks, Adam. San Antonio Mayor Ron Nuremberg, live with us up next. Separating the facts from the fear that is out there. It's one of the things we try to do with the KSAT Q&A and get some of your questions, our questions answered. And as he does every Wednesday, we are joined by San Antonio Mayor Ron Nuremberg, who joins us live after the briefing. Mr. Mayor, thank you for joining us. This for has sure. been it's been a time where we have seen numbers added, numbers taken away, some confusion about what we're, what's happening with the state. Uh, Metro Health admitting that there were some double counts recently how frustrating is that for you when you want to keep the focus on masks and social distancing and washing your hands and the fact that we are in a pandemic how how frustrating has that been it is frustrating on a number of levels i, I would say number one uh, we have a very high standard of accuracy and timeliness that we've established during this pandemic and the truth of the matter is you know people are stuck in home and looking at this data on an, on an hourly basis sometimes and want to know the latest. And so there is a set there is an expectation set on the part of everyone in this country now that that we need some information and we need it now. Um, you know, we put we put some of the health professionals on a little bit of a bind, though, because the, if it weren't for this pandemic, some of this data uh, would be coming to us and in, in clean and and verified over a period of years, not a period of hours. So we're condensing this. I will say that what has complicated this entire process is that the state uh, of Texas has changed the methodology by which they report data more than twice with regard to deaths, uh, with regard to how we count positive cases. And some of that is in conflict with not only the CDC and cities around the country, but also with our own standards of accuracy. When we reported data, whether it's 
a positive case uh, or a death in this community, we want to make sure it's factual. And uh, sometimes and, and quite often over the last couple of weeks, what we're getting back from the state is not that. Mayor, you talk about your frustration and you mentioned two people looking at this information. We're all trying to make decisions about our daily lives, let alone right. the big decision of back to school based on an accurate depiction of where we are at this point in this yeah. pandemic. So what's your message to people watching this at home, people who are looking at that data at home? What's your message to them about how they should be interpreting all of this confusion and also the city's effort to yeah. try to make this as accurate as possible? So uh, people should feel confident when you go to covid19.sanantonio.gov, you will see a complete and accurate picture of where we are. But we've been cautioning folks from the, from the very start, don't get caught up in the daily case numbers um, uh, because what we wanna do is look at trends. And what we are seeing in the trends has remained true throughout this entire period. We've seen a, a, a bit of a peak back in April, which came down because we all started getting devoted to physical distancing and mask wearing. Then we saw the spike that occurred as a result of uh, the reopening speed of Texas and the lowering of the fast, uh, face masks, as well as the limiting of, of local authority. And we saw a huge spike and an acceleration of cases. We have now with the state backing up our face mask orders and a, and a recommitment for all of us to physical distancing, started to see those numbers plateau and even now start to come down. That's where we are, but this is no time to let off, the, let off of our commitment and let our guard down. What we have to do is continue to drive down transmission as much as we possibly can as we get towards a period in the fall when we know there's more infection of respiratory disease, schools are beginning to open, as well as um, you know, all the other activities that happen during the fall like Labor Day. So we've got to continue to work to keep those numbers moving in the right direction. This has already played, placed a deadly toll on our community, but what we are doing by physical distancing and mask wearing is working. We just have to keep it up. San Antonio Mayor Rod Nurmer gonna ask you to stay with us for one more segment. Uh, I wanna talk about schools and the town hall that's sure. just a few minutes away. We'll be right back. We're back with the mayor now in our Q&A. And mayor, last week we had the interim director of Metro Health, Dr. Colleen Bridger, on this uh, segment to talk about whether it's possible for a positive patient to be counted more than once in Metro Health's totals. We were told at that point no, but then on Monday we, we heard that that's because duplicates were removed. The reason being is because someone was counted potentially four or five times. She said that's not out of the question. So what happened uh, to make that possible? I mean, we thought the answer was there could be no duplicates. It seems like some were duplicates. This seems, to, and it also yeah. fits in. I mean, we're you're also find, finding social media in this whole me getting the messaging out. And there are a lot of conspiracy right. theories out there that people are Absolutely. being counted double. Yeah, so we do know that there's 41,000, I believe, cases, total cases. We know those are unique cases because what, so the, the scenario that we found was that in about 1%, there were multiple reports of, the, of a person testing positive because they took multiple tests, but the reporting agency uh, changed something about their contact information, the spelling of their name, something that made it a unique case uh, within the system. So Metro Health uh, went through all those manually to remove those duplicates, and it was a roughly I think 600 cases out of the 40,000, so a relatively small number. But the, 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 the manual duplication found those cases in which there was a different spelling of a name or a different name or a different contact uh, address or something like that. All right, so we've got a town hall coming up in about you know, a little less than 10 minutes here uh, on the city's website and the city's television channel about back to school. Specifically, will a new health initiative be announced for Metro Health during this news conference, or when can we expect that? Uh, so there won't be a new directive in terms of what Metro Health and the Public Health uh, Authority is recommending to keep students, families, teachers, uh, staff safe. Uh, but what is going to happen tonight is feedback from the community of all stakeholders who are part of this town hall, but also a, a linking of metrics to when schools could be opening safely. So the metrics that they have already talked about, which will be discussed tonight 
uh, are the positivity rate, which is happening in our community, uh, which at its high point was about 25 percent back in May. It was at a low point at three and a half percent. Right now it's at 15 percent. We need it right around five percent once we start opening up. Uh, so positivity rate being one. We also want to see a sustained two week decline of cases. And we've begun that trend in the right direction, but we're not there yet. And then, of course, the doubling rate, how long it takes uh, to double the number of cases of infections in our community. That's a measure of how fast it's spreading in our city. And we were at a very low point, I think right around 12, 14 days. We moved up to 16, 18, and now we're 21 days. So we're in better shape there. But those are the kinds of measures and metrics that Dr. Wu and the, and the public health community want to discuss with the school communities to make sure that we have metrics associated when we open schools safely. All right, and that town hall happening at 7 o'clock tonight. You can watch it on the city's website, the city's television channel, also the city's Facebook page. Mayor Ron Nirenberg, thanks for being with us as always. Thanks, y'all. Be safe. We'll be right back.